Hi, I'm Steve Miller. Call me Slim. And this is the Ask Slim Market Week. It's a look back at what happened in the financial markets in the past week and a look forward at what might happen in the next. And we always have some interesting things in the middle. Today is going to be even more interesting because doing it a little bit different, you know, my focus when I do workshops or work with traders as a coach is always on both the uh, technical and psychological aspects of the market. So uh, try to take a holistic look at when I work with traders. So uh, I wanted to share a special with you today, just uh, one of our member videos that I think is really valuable. Uh, and you'll see that later on in the show, 16 signs that fear is contaminating your trading. I think you're going to find it interesting. Also, a little bit different, I want to give you a little advanced look at the stocks that uh, I'm going to be showing you charts on this week so you know what to look for. Here's a little peek at that, and you can see in here that we're going to be looking at uh, some of the gold stocks and silver, New, uh, Newmont and uh, Barrick Gold and uh, PAAS, which is Pan American Silver, Pfizer, which had a deal called off, uh, some energy stocks, uh, and Halliburton is one of those, um, Wynn uh, Resorts. And then a bunch of retailers, Gap Stores, Dillard's, Macy's, Nordstrom's, Coors, Urban, American Eagle Outfitter, and uh, then Cree. And then, of course, the six other groups uh, of um, indexes and futures that we look at when we do our short-term view, when we look at the markets in oil and gold and the euro and the bond market and the stock market in SPX and, of course, looking also at implied volatility. So that is uh, the look at the group of charts that we're going to be showing you later on in the show. Let's talk about the markets this week. Stock market, well, in a Y chop, we'll call it, um, pretty much driven uh, by the same and some new things also, oil, currencies, and government meddling. How about that? That's really been the drivers in the market this week. Uh, S&P 500 down a little bit, down a little more than 1% on the week. We were looking for uh, the market to kind of erode this week, have a modest decline. Pretty much got that after the big run that the stock market did have. Currency markets, uh, they were the stimulus. Uh, for a couple of the days on the downside for sure. The yen plane out exploded to the upside against the dollar. Uh, it appears that uh, Jap Japan, which is in huge trouble with massive debt to GDP, um, uh, their abenomics, which is essentially the Japanese version of Keynesianism, is a total failure big surprise there. And uh, they've done this kitchen sink thing. They're just going to front end all of their um, spending, it appears. And uh, that, uh, that brought the yen dollar relationship to uh, just a huge change as the yen just exploded against the dollar. Well, why? Because they're going to do all this fiscal spending. And it's kind of that they're thinking that they're going to abandon, uh, at least for a while, the debasement of their currency. So that got the yen moving up sharply. It got the markets really nervous as uh, we got some pretty big uh, corrections on some of those days. Gold also benefited from that uh, yen dollar move uh, and with some big uh, moves uh, both on uh, Tuesday and Thursday in the gold market, not really just a, a small gain for the week, but gold stocks exploded. And we're going to look at those also later on in the show. Oil, wide range. We were looking for it to get down under the 36 level and then uh, put on a bounce. The bounce was bigger than we really expected. Uh, and uh, the range has been pretty wide uh, all the way down to 35 and a quarter early on in the week and then gets very near the $40 number, nearly up 6% on the day on Friday. So a uh, strong day. And it seems like 5% days up or down are a regular occurrence here in the oil market. You know, there's some hope in there that there will be a freeze of production as a meeting is coming up later in the month by the producing nations. That is very unlikely. Iran is talking about the fact that they have been punished for so long, they don't want to freeze their production. And I'm even reading things where they're already doing some discounting. So I'm surprised by the up move that we have here on Friday. Uh, and I think we're going to see oil moving down again. Uh, we have to mention 
mention this, of course, uh, and uh, it might have been what really helped the market to move on the downside on Thursday, which was the biggest down day of the week. The Obama administration came out with a new rule that essentially ends serial inversions, uh, and uh, what it did was break up the uh, deal between Pfizer and Allergen, and we'll look at that uh, Pfizer stock a little bit later on. So deal canceled. You know, <clears throat> it's it's pretty simple. The corporate rates here in the United States, peak rate, well, it's over 40% when you look at the highest uh, corporate rate tax rate and uh, local rates. And when you look at Ireland, their rate is 12.5%. So it makes sense that business is going to go over there. So instead of fixing our tax laws, they make up these rules to stop it. They don't want to correct the problem. All they want to do is get in the way of corporate efficiencies. Department of Justice did the same thing, stopping the Halliburton Baker Hughes merger. So they'll do anything to stop these uh, co uh, the corporate efficiencies, which may actually have people you know, hiring more people because the companies are doing better. Uh, why don't they just fix the tax laws? I just needed this little moment for this mini rant uh, instead of trying to mandate things that just don't work. It's so typical and it so pisses me off. Anyway, let's talk about Yellen for what's that one second because she also helped the market go up on Friday because she said there is no bubble. Uh, and uh, we had some <coughs> some news out uh, over uh, the last few days, well, where, you know, Trump, who for sure would know, right, says that there is a bubble in the market. And then uh, one of your favorite t TV touts, who I won't say his name, he actually also confirmed that possibility. So, <coughs> pardon my cold, and this is my deep voice going on, uh, that uh, had the... Um, a market moving up, but it couldn't really hold uh, much on Friday. Just want to mention uh, regarding this Yellen comment about we're not in a bubble. She actually was interviewed and admitted, uh, I think it was in 2013, that said she did not see the risk coming in uh, the financial crisis based on securitization and other things that she totally missed. Bernanke missed it too. So you want to trust her when she says there is no bubble? Anyway, had to bring that up. That's what moved the markets this week. Let's take a look here at the uh, chart of the S&P 500 hourly chart, and uh, we'll see uh, what these influences were in the market and what these moves were. <coughs> and there you can see on Monday, the market overnight in the gray area tried to rally on Monday. You got a nice move there overnight, but then it moved down uh, and uh, opened lower in here on Monday. Uh, really, the rally that tried to come just absolutely faded after that. Interesting that Tesla came out at that point. We thought they only had 135,000 sales. They have over 300 pre-orders in there. And the stock, well, up until up through Wednesday was really strong and then started to correct some. So we had this day here on uh, Wednesday, on Monday, where uh, those um, uh, attempted rallies uh, couldn't get you anywhere. That was a tip off that uh, we were gonna get a decline. Eurozone down sharply. Germany, it gets weak data down 2.3%. Buns uh, fall to a, a one-year one low in their yields. And U.S. stocks, well, they uh, opened lower and then were just choppy. You could see all this selling overnight that went on and this wide chop that went on in here uh, in uh, the U.S. Uh, market. Dollar, yen at a 17-month low, and that was just a precursor of what was going to happen. And gold moves up pretty sharply on that weakness. Uh, on uh, Wednesday comes, there was little change going on overnight here in the markets, but gold moves, uh, oh, I'm sorry, oil moves up 5% uh, on a very surprised inventory drop that helped move the U.S. markets up. It faltered a little bit into the FOMC minutes, but then exploded on the close for the biggest update of the week. This is the day, though, that it was announced that uh, the DOJ was ending that Halliburton BHI deal. 
and uh, also the Pfizer uh, allergen deal. And uh, then when the market started to digest it, selling started to come in. The dollar, US, the dollar yen right over here has a huge break right there, and that sends markets down. And you can see a big, big down day to the lowest levels of the week in there. And uh, uh, Japan tried jawboning the yen back down, but they really couldn't do it. Sokgen comes out and says a recession is imminent, uh, and uh, they could be right. Uh, <clears throat> ECB comes out and they say negative rates help, but uh, they're not going to do negative rates anymore. They're likely not to push them down anymore. So uh, that uh, also was helping the stock market move to the downside. Friday comes, well, Eurozone got a bit of a bounce, uh, all about 1%. Uh, Yellen comes out. She says no bubble. Dudley comes out. and He's very cautious. He says um, only gradual increases in interest rates. So we get this pop early in the day, but then you could see sellers come in. And I got to tell you here, um, there is a tone change going on. I had to give myself that little note there uh, because uh, that is uh, a look of a market that cannot hold rallies and that is a, certainly a concern in here let's take a look at the calendar for the week uh, as we get a sense for what we're looking at in the week that earnings are about to start coming out did you know that uh, earnings are expected to be nine percent down uh, for the quarter finally uh, this period that we went through where revenues got weaker but earnings got manufactured higher uh, by all of the buybacks well we're getting past that period right now and now there's expected to be a lot weaker earnings situation <coughs> that could be in the way of the stock market here take a look here at this uh, calendar and uh, not a lot of uh, market moving uh, news that I can see here uh, during the week we have consumer prices on Thursday that's usually not that big of a market mover uh, the uh, I can't really see much else consumer sentiment can move the market a little bit there on um, Friday so earnings start to come out always the opener after the close on Monday Alcoa that's always the first sign and then we usually start to get some of the um, uh, bank earnings coming out you can see we have before the opening on Wednesday JP Morgan we have Bank of America and Wells Fargo PNC Bank uh, on Thursday and Citigroup on Friday in those uh, bank earnings those are some very very weak stocks as a matter of fact when you look at this market and you see the um, <clears throat> Look, the uh, very, very weak financial charts. You got to really wonder uh, if any leadership is going to come from them. And I got to tell you, I doubt it based on looking at those patterns. That is the opening segment for the week. We're going to be right back with the best and worst and some very interesting charts. For the best of the week, one stock that I've talked about three weeks in a row as it was beginning to soar was Virgin Airlines. And man, that thing is gone. Um, taken over by Alaska Air and confirmed uh, stock $57, up 44% on the week. And uh, love that airlines. Just uh, they do a great job and makes sense they were taken over. So uh, in this week that was really a choppy week, um, we've had surprisingly um, the best movers came really in the gold or energy category um, where gold and energy, uh, well, gold at least uh, didn't make that much of a move. Uh, energy, the oil markets, well, that did manage to uh, get a rebound going. But uh, big moves there, 13% uh, gains in like Newmont and Barrick Gold and the silver stocks like PAAS. Let's take a look at all three of those stocks here and uh, you'll get a sense for what are just uh, fantastic moves in here in the gold stocks. Uh, Newmont, uh, this 13% gain is on top of other really massive gains. It gets into a very big resistance area. Man, we turned bullish on it as it uh, broke out of that cycle um, way, way down over here, and this thing just explodes, uh, moving up from 16 to 29. Uh, 29.36 is the high this week. Just a huge move. You can see in here that we're looking for it to come down into the corrupt in a corrective period, uh, falling down to somewhere around that 25 area. 
uh, as we believe gold is also going to correct. But take a look here and you'll see this beautiful diamond formation on this shorter term pattern uh, where it was uh, just kind of trucking up this um, this channel and then forms this diamond and then breaks out on the upside. Uh, yesterday looked like it was reversing, uh, but then get some legs on really only a $5 move in gold today. So just a, uh, a surprising huge amount of strength here. Of course, it's about leverage for these uh, companies. Uh, gold goes up and they do way better uh, because of the um, uh, margins improving. Uh, than you would expect uh, just because of the gold rise. So just a uh, really giant move here. Look at ABX, very similar pattern in there, and you'll see this big diamond, and today it looks like it's breaking out. This one has not moved to a new high, but you can see a very similar pattern. Those diamonds are pretty unusual and a good-looking consolidation there. When they're really big and show up on, on weekly charts, they're usually major tops or bottoms, but when they're on daily charts, they're usually consolidations, and you can see how pretty that one is and how that looked. One more look at uh, a similar-looking uh, stock, PAAS, is what we're going to look at, which was Pan American Silver, and you can see um, just absolutely explodes out of that diamond. This stock moving up from $5.38 just a couple of months ago, uh, all the way up now to twelve thirteen. So fabulous uh, moves in there on the upside in these gold stocks. They are very, very due for a pullback and a rest, and we think uh, gold is going to help them uh, in uh, getting some consolidation in here again. Uh, and I think there's uh, going to be a good opportunity to buy them. I talk about that in my stock sectors video I did this week, so it's in the member video, stock sectors, if you want to see that. Uh, Pfizer, I uh, have to look at that one. Man, uh, talked about uh, this uh, earlier uh, uh, about the new rule passed that prevented their merger with Allergen and a uh, company out of Ireland and take a look at PFE uh, going the opposite direction uh, that we saw as far as allergen goes uh, this moving up allergen collapsing after that news so stock uh, has a big gain in there you could see this weekly chart in here uh, this uh, news really threw, threw off the patterns. We were looking for this decline to kind of continue right in here uh, and then get another up move right here based on these patterns, but moved up fast when they called off the deal here. So uh, that is a look at Pfizer, AGN. Well, I'm not going to put that up, but a pretty big collapse. Uh, when you look at the energy stocks, there were some big movers in there. In fact, some of the biggest movers, Whiting Oil, WLL, moves up. 23%. I see no news in there whatsoever. Uh, just all of a sudden, buyers show up in that stock. Uh, the uh, natural gas stocks, with natural gas being really in a negative pattern, have done quite well also this week. Uh, uh, Devon is one that you should look at, DVN or Devon, uh, and that went up 10% on the week, a uh, pretty strong one. And uh, Apache and APC, uh, Anadarko, both of those up 8% uh, and 6%, uh, and those are both in rising phases, all of them. That Devon is the one to look at because it's got a big inverted head and shoulders in there, and it's trading right on that neckline right now. So take a look at that one, DVN. I'll put up Halliburton, H-A-L. This one gains about 8% in the week. This one has actually gotten up to an area that I think it's a sell, and uh, that's what I, why I wanted to show it to you. This is our uh, cycle chart in there, uh, which is um, the uh, look at the um, cash, you know, the movements of money in and out, essentially. And uh, you could see here where both cycles were coming down. That gave you that decline there. The same thing happened right over here and right over here. And that's about to happen right over here. So uh, Halliburton gets up into this resistance zone. It's uh, now made uh, another, you know, kind of a nice bounce also, moving up from a low of 27.64 all the way up to 38. This is a problem for it. We're going to look in this 30 39 area, 39, 39 and a half, as about the most we expect to see in here, and then get some rolling over there in <coughs> Halliburton. 
uh, the uh, next stock that we'll look at, or the last one in our best of the week, is WYNN, W-Y-N-N. This stock had an important resistance area right here, this big red zone. Uh, they came out uh, after and uh, said that they're gonna build a big entertainment park uh, in uh, Las Vegas. The stock got a big jump in there, so it gains 9% on the week, but again, this is a big resistance zone. We're gonna look again for this decline to come right in here, Pull back, we'd love to buy the stock right around $84, $85. Now trading at $98, that would be a big correction, right? But the patterns are suggestive of that. And then after that, we expect to see a much better period over there. So Wynn Resorts gets this uh, nice pop on the news that they're going to be building this entertainment park in Las Vegas. That's the best of the week. We'll be right back with the worst. For the worst of the week, I got to say the word retail, man, uh, really getting obliterated this week. Starts out um, basically with a lot of weakness as uh, Amazon.com is taking aim at the fashion industry. So a lot of those higher end retailers, especially the fashion sellers like uh, Coors, uh, getting really hammered. Uh, also then on Friday comes out Gap Stores uh, as they come out and say that their inventories are growing and their sales are falling and that's really bad news so uh, the teen retailers get hit also so retail stocks under a lot of pressure this week patterns playing out awful when we look at these charts I'm going to show you them right now starting out with the stock of Gap stores take a look here on Gap's Gap and uh, you're going to see in here as we look again at our cyclical patterns that uh, as the lows were pointed to right over here and this rally right over here, now we're looking at this May-June period as a very weak period. When I take a closer look at it in here, you'll see a very classic looking uh, hanging man right in the middle of this evening star that formed and made this top. When I switch over to the daily, interesting, this one was a diamond. I just showed you diamonds in the uh, that were consolidation patterns that brought rallies in the uh, precious metal stocks. Now you can see in here as it plain out turned over. Uh, we had positive momentum going on based on the slim ribbon starting right down over here. Got the nice rally. And then this turned out to be like a head and shoulders top right there that you can see that broke down. And now you have uh, the momentum stalled here three days ago and then turned down in a big way. Massive volume coming in here. Breaks down under the uh, moving averages. <clears throat> this is a stock that looks like it's got trouble for a long period of time. Let's stay in the teen retailers. Um, URBN is the next one we're going to uh, switch over to. And uh, you'll see in here, this one also huge trouble. Now you can see this uh, engulfing pattern right there. It even has a broadening pattern going on. This one I have the colored phasing in there, so it uh, gives you an idea as to the rising and uh, bearish phases. This will now turn into a yellow phase in here starting next week. And here's your engulfing pattern right there. Uh, we had a sense that it was topping, and sure enough, uh, and uh, here's your broadening pattern right there, which is a sign of a big top. This one looks like it declines here out into uh, May area or later, so uh, not a good-looking chart there at all. Take a look here at this unbelievable island top right in here as it uh, breaks down now. Uh, gets a little bit of a bounce in here. We would expect it to fall down to that 26 area, uh, where that uh, 26 area where that 89 day moving average is right over there. So Urban, another really bad looking chart. And uh, while we're in teen, let's take a look at AEO. Uh, and uh, this one, American Eagle Outfitters, a very similar pattern also. Here you could see as it rolls over the decline in here due through middle of May. So we're expecting that decline to uh, accelerate. And uh, you can see in here, just a classic head and shoulders top and already making the measurement uh, the parallel lines tell us the measurement in here bad bad looking pattern getting a little support here at the 89 day moving average but based on this pattern uh, the, the these stocks look absolutely dreadful 
and I think any rally in there in uh, those teen retailers and you have to sell them. They really look bad. Let's stay in the retail category here and look at these other stocks that are affected by now Amazon talking about moving into fashion. And uh, we'll take a look first at DDS, which is a Dillard's. Uh, and you'll see uh, and more of these really horrible breakdowns. Now, uh, I want to note before I switch over to that weekly, right here at the 89-day moving average again, that's an area you would expect support, and we have negative momentum having been established in DDS. When I look here at the weekly chart, this one is uh, due to decline all the way through the end of May based on these cycle patterns, uh, and you can see in here it did not get up to that resistance level up there and then just roll over with a another classic looking engulfing pattern right there that said that a top was being made so uh, that is Dillard's take a look at Macy's I thought Macy's was going to give us a little upside play in here uh, and it has not been able to do so here you'll see that uh, it comes right down to support but I'm concerned about uh, this pattern uh, in that in the rally that was due right over here maybe has come and gone already and uh, all of this time period here out into the end of May does not look good we're looking for a little rally off of there but I think it's a sale if that does come also so that's a look at Macy's uh, and uh, now the other one that we're going to look at in here is JWN uh, in, uh, in Nordstrom, of course, definitely in the high-end fashion area. And you can see in here as this thing rolls over. Now, the way this pattern sets up is that you may get some support in here, another attempted rally, but then this goes all the way out into the end of June uh, before that pattern is over with. So lots of negative patterns in here in retail. Boy, you got to think about it when retail goes bad. And here's that 89-day moving average that it's moving down through. Uh, when retail goes bad, uh, there is uh, really a concern uh, about uh, the consumer out there. Maybe it's an anomaly because uh, Amazon is attacking them, and maybe it's just a, a fact of life that these stocks look just uh, uh, bad, and the consumer out there is just plain out spent out. So that's an issue. One more stock to discuss for solar. Uh, they had their analyst day this week. Uh, take a look at a double top and double sell signal in that one. It was down 9% on the week, and that one looks like it's got more to go on the downside. So uh, very uh, interesting uh, groups there uh, when we look at those stocks that really got hammered. One more stock that we'll look at in here uh, that I want to look at is Cree, C-R-E-E. -E. Cree is down 13%. Uh, they're the light bulb maker. Take a look here as we look at this chart in Cree. Um, note, uh, we'll look, put up the weekly first. Uh, this looks to me like a perfect touch of this resistance right over here. It then rolls over. It's due to go down through the middle of May right there. You can see here is where we're pointing to the timing for the next low on our uh, cycle charts. And uh, here you could see the daily chart. It was perfect action as it gives you the sell signal right here with the evening star, gives you the break, creates the bear pennant, and then breaks down in a giant gap in here. The stock tries to rally in here. It's going to be a great sale because, as we said, we believe it's going to continue down uh, through the end of May. So create a, a bad, bad looking stock in there. Uh, so that is it for the worst of the week. And uh, stay tuned. We've got something really special right now. Just a little intro to the segment that's coming up right now. In our member area, we have seven different categories of member videos. We produce three of those a week, which includes Wednesday, one of our most popular, which is Futures Speak, where we look at six different categories of the futures market, do cycle analysis on 25 different charts. We also have tools for text, and we have things about uh, for the IRA, IRA for longer holdings, and uh, uh, big picture of all the different markets where we take a longer view of the markets. Just a whole assortment of great things in there. One of the great ones is trader psychology. There's lots of videos in there that will help you a lot. Of course, our goal is to raise your probability of success. And there's a lot more to that than just looking at the charts or just looking at strategies. 
there is certainly a lot more. So I encourage you to watch this segment coming up. Looking forward to getting your comments on that. And here comes 16 signs that fear is contaminating your trading. Trader psychology. 16 signs that fear is contaminating trading. This is really an important topic. Uh, so many of the emails that I get from people uh, talk about this struggle, struggle with fear coming in their trading. Interesting. It comes up uh, for people even trading with paper money, but especially making that transition as they're just starting from paper money to real money. So many say, I'm really confident in my analysis that I'm doing the strategic approaches all than that, and more of my calls are correct than they are wrong. Um, the problem is, is that as soon as they enter into a trade, fear comes in. It actually comes in quickly, and what happens is they uh, eliminate uh, their uh, position quickly because, well, they want to make sure they have a gain, right? And uh, Or they will exit way too late because, well, they have a loss going on, and uh, fear is coming in uh, that uh, it will be uh, a loss that they don't feel good about taking, and it becomes a big loss. Um, the... Uh, real emotion often comes in uh, when um, the trade is you know sizable uh, and uh, that uh, so for some reason all analysis then is abandoned uh, at that point uh, because uh, well they're afraid that if they actually do what they followed then uh, if they followed their rules then they would end up uh, having to exit a trade that had a loss uh, and uh, or they just stick in it and it, it results in a uh, failed trades a lot of failed trades this is like I said the most common question I get and it's way back in 2001 uh, I did a, an article in SFO magazine it was in their premier issue of SFO it's a long time I've been writing for these magazines uh, and it was uh, about fear uh, coming into your trading and I talked about certain processes in there so I've been looking at this issue for a long time, most common problem for traders. Thing is, is that, you know, while fear comes in, the risk is really not money. It's most often not money. It's other things about us. It's a perception of the consequence of being wrong. It comes often out of our history. Um, what happens is a part of us comes up, comes forth. Uh, you can call it the shadow part, you could call it the risk manager part of us that you know comes online to protect us. That's what fear really is, uh, a, a reason, uh, something that comes up, an emotion uh, that uh, wants us to take action. Uh, but uh, we've learned to take these actions from fear uh, in uh, other aspects of our life. So we're afraid of these consequences that we learned much, much uh, earlier in our life and uh, the emotion that's attached to it. So these emotions come up, fear is the one we're talking about now the most, and then we figure out ways to not feel the fear and uh, that gets us into a lot of trouble. Uh, in uh, most cases, the instant we get into a trade, uh, that part of us comes up and there's this screaming in our head, there is risk here. And uh, so then we start figuring out ways uh, to um, maneuver because we're blowing it out of proportion. Lots of different things can go on for us. And we're going to uh, look at 16 different ways that uh, we may be acting that can give us some sense that fear is actually coming into our trading. I have a whole set of slides in here that we're going to uh, look at in a moment and you're going to see a lot of things that are probably um, happening to you at times in your trading. Um, we talk. I talk a lot about emotions, and uh, if you go back uh, in uh, the uh, in member dashboard and go to trading psychology, where you clicked on this 
uh, video, you'll see in there that I did a uh, or, or an earlier video on the basics of emotions, and uh, I think that's an important one to watch. I'm not going to duplicate that here. But we talk a lot about what the emotions actually mean. Um, in my experience in trading, fear is probably the most common, though shame does come up a lot. Uh, shame and guilt. Uh, shame being um, what we believe about ourselves, guilt being about something that we did. Uh, and uh, the, the, the messages behind the, these emotions coming up are really, really valuable. So I'm going to go through this set of slides here and look at these uh, 16 uh, different um, emotions that could be coming up and uh, I think that you're going to find these um, really, really interesting and probably a lot that come up for you. We're going to switch over right now to the slides and uh, here you go. So uh, 16 red flags that fear is contaminating trading. So uh, we're going to go through four different slides here. Each have four of them on there. And maybe, maybe you want to make some notes or go back through this. But uh, it's important to recognize this. Uh, number one, changes in our bodies. You know, sweaty palms, racing heart, loss of focus. Uh, as the body essentially gets ready to retreat or fight. Uh, and uh, so, you know, this uh, when fear comes in, there's a threat. And that's why our body changes in this way to deal with the threat. If this happens, you know that there's something in your trading that is a threat to you. Next one is overanalyzing. So you review and you review and you review and you're really fixated on getting it right. Uh, and uh, what happens, of course, is that the market just goes on and on and you're not even in there playing. You're just uh, looking. You're disregarding the uh, analysis and signals. You really, in this case, you are second guessing yourself and uh, you're, you know, you're hoping uh, and when you're second guessing, you're often hoping your analysis has maybe been wrong. Uh, and that means that uh, you don't know whether you were right in the first place, or which looks wrong, or you're going to be right or wrong if you change your mind. So you don't have any confidence in your trading, and you're disregarding everything that you're seeing. Next one is not following your uh, plan or um, even reviewing your plan. It's fear that the review will make us get out of our positions or then trade responsibly because we're not trading the way we really designed and uh, we're feeling a fear, we're feeling sadness, anger, whatever it is that's coming up about it. And uh, if we go in and start reviewing, that means we have to get out of our positions. We have to stop getting out of this hope place that's actually very, very dysfunctional. So we don't review our plan. We don't follow our plan because we're still in this place of hoping. The next one, uh, well, it's uh, slow to react on problems. Uh, positions are losing. Uh, and uh, we have a hesitancy, and that hesitancy lets the trade get away. It comes really from fear of taking the loss and being in a place of hope. So we're really slow to react on a problem. Next one, number six, is slow to react on an opportunity. You know, everything has to be perfect. Does it have to be really? I mean, there's a, a lack of self-trust that's obviously coming up, and of course, fear that we'll be wrong. So what do we do? Well, the opportunity just simply gets away or we react on it very, very late. And that's, you know, of course, gets us into some trouble on that. Underutilizing capital. We have actually very few positions. Some people that are strategic option traders or committed to that style of trading, well, simply they would, um, you know, hope to have quite a number of positions on to try to make the numbers work for them. Uh, but uh, if you uh, don't have the positions on that you committed to, that's fear. Well, fear you can't handle them all. Fear they may all go wrong, wrong at once. You know, and uh, that brings low returns as you underutilize your capital. The next one is uh, focus uh, on your account balance. You're fixated on that P&L. It causes a distraction. You're, it seems like you're always looking at those numbers. And often, you know, you have trades that you want to make, but you're afraid you're going to lose more money. So you don't even want to put on more positions unless uh, that number is positive. Can you imagine that? 
The next one is focus on money versus trading uh, your plan and your method. So this is a lot like the last one we're talking about, but this is more about the big picture, not so much looking at the P&L, but looking at your life, uh, fear that you can't pay your bills, your, you know, your college funds, or fear that um, your spouse or significant other is gonna react again you know, maybe you made a deal with them. Maybe there's a, only a limit of time you committed. Maybe you have made a, a limit on the amount of money uh, you're going to commit to uh, your trading. Uh, but uh, you're focusing now on that. You're not focusing on your plan anymore. You really need to start dealing with that issue. Uh, next one is over trading. Boy, this is very common, and this has been common to me. This is one of the issues that I had a lot, especially early in my career. Things start to go wrong. You want to get the money back. You're thrashing. You're 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 putting on a ton of trades very very quickly in and out, and uh, even getting whipsawed. You know, buying them when they're going up and selling them when they're going down, and entering trades really late. And it's all about, of course, the fear of missing the trade that's going to well get you back to the plus and having no and not having fear, feeling better about yourself. A lot about this uh, is about self-esteem, of course. Next one is taking excessive risk. Positions are way too big. You're doing suicide trading. Um, what is suicide trading? Well, it's like I'm already in big trouble. I'm already going broke. I'm already out of business. I already have to tell my wife or, or significant other how bad it is. I might as well just go crazy here and take some huge trades. And, uh, you know, it's desperation to get the losses back. That's what suicide trading is, taking excessive risk. Next is taking profits too fast. Man, there is a stigma out there, uh, and everybody says, don't let a winner become a loser. So we have all this fear of profits getting away from us. A winner becomes a loser. No, I would be bad if that happened. So that's the first 12. And uh, here is the last four of red flags that fear is contaminating trading. Well, really late entering trades. And you get a lot of self-talk around this. I better not let this one get away again. Uh, and what happens consistently is that uh, because we're entering trades late, you know, minor reactions make the trade a loser. And then more fear comes in. It's a negative feedback loop. We start doing more of these trades that are kind of out of sync with the market. And it gets us into a lot of trouble. Next one is, well, trading news. And generally when you're trading news, you see something moving. It's already moved. The news is already out. You see a big move and you want to get on board. You're afraid you're going to miss this one. And again, you know, minor reactions after the news uh, make us a loser on the trade. And then we tend to bail. And uh, the um, next two, I think, are extraordinarily important. Uh, when fear is coming into our traders, we have a large percentage of losing trades versus our winning trades. You know, uh, fear brings poor entries and exits. And I believe for swing traders, uh, day traders, scalpers, you need at least 55% winning trades. So it's, it's generally 55% winners, 35% losers, and about 10% break even or close to break even. And that percentage gets you to a very, very profitable trading uh, situation. So and the next one is poor win-loss uh, ratio, and that's the size of the wins versus losses. And what happens is, is that when you have a lot of fear coming into your trades, your, your losses are, um, are bigger than your profits. Uh, profits are small because you're afraid and you exit quickly. Losers are big because, well, you're hoping and uh, or you're frozen, uh, you're flooded with emotion, and you actually can't maximize winners. And I like to tell people you need to get at least uh, 1.25 to 1 win-loss ratio. So that is the um, uh, really the, what I call the 16 signs that fear is contaminating your trading. 
and uh, that I think there's a lot of value in there. Um, I, th I think if you go back and watch that again and again, you could take some notes. You can get some sense that uh, there are a lot of things in there that come up for you. I know they come up for me, and I've been at this for 41 years. Um, there are you know other signs uh, that uh, I think that are real strong red flags that I kind of want to speak about separately. And the question is, you know, are you outside of trading? Now, these are kind of outside of trading, doing things that are addictive. In other words, you're, you're numbing yourself so that you don't feel. And when you numb yourself, you don't get to numb selectively. If you're numbing yourself through addictive behavior, you know, alcohol, drugs, overeating, sex, there's countless things out there that you could be doing that with. You, you also numb your, your consciousness, you numb your intentions, you kill your intuitive process. So um, that's a big uh, sign that there's an issue which is numbing. Also, you may be afraid to share your results. That's another big sign, the sign that you'll be discovered. That goes way back uh, to things that go on internally for me, for all of us, uh, in that uh, somebody will know something about us that is negative. We're failing at what we're doing. We're not following our plan. Uh, the results are poor, and we take that on uh, as an identification of ourself. Uh, so we lie about it. That's a big red flag when we're uh, deceiving people that we have uh, committed to. Um, the, uh, all of this feels like a real threat, but the, the truth is, is that you really have to put yourself in a place, get the language in a place that puts the threat into proportion and how it really affects our overall life. Uh, and tell yourself, really, when you get into one of these places of high emotion and fear, that, that these things are relatively small, that we want to weight them properly in our life, and that we will survive this. These are just trades. Uh, and uh, know that your losses are accept acceptable. Acceptability is a big word here because it's w when we say that our losses are acceptable, that we're acting in ways that are acceptable, even if it means we've acted in ways that are not within our plan, that have been, had bigger losses, that we then take steps after that you know, uh, that uh, rectify the situation and that we are acceptable as people, uh, separating that identification of our trading to the uh, identifications uh, of ourselves. Uh, really need to break ourselves uh, from those connections to our past where there were messages that came to us about not being acceptable, about doing things wrong, uh, and uh, put it more into a context of who we are now as successful people, as parents, as uh, as uh, children, successful children to our parents uh, in other aspects of our career and how we deal uh, in the world and whatever our mission is, what our public service is, what things that we do that really help people. Those are really important things to take on about ourselves, so that we're not in a place of negativity and letting these fear, these fears come in and blow up on us uh, where we're making them way bigger than they really belong. Uh, remember that no matter what, no matter what happens in trading, that doesn't take away the greatness of who you are as a person, and that's really the big thing to hold on to. Now, uh, I often offer processes about getting through these trading um, uh, getting through emotions in trading, I have a reluctancy to do that as I've gone more and more over the years in these processes. I, 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 I'm, st I'm stammering on this because I don't like to promote myself on these videos, actually, uh, in the member videos here. Uh, but if there is, you know, I have a way that somebody can book an hour with me uh, and we could do the processes that I have. If fear is coming into your trading and contaminating it, uh, that uh, in just a session or two, we could do go a long way in dealing with this. If you look on the website, you'll see under coaching, emergency roadside assistance. And uh, that's what I call my one hour, two hour sessions that you could book me for if you want to work uh, through this. So. 
uh, and uh, fear coming into your trading, I think we can get pretty far on that. Uh, so that is the uh, 16 signs that uh, fear is contaminating your trading. Uh, again, you remember, if you just have a couple of questions, you can go into the dashboard, click email slim, and send your comments or questions in there. I hope and I believe that you found this valuable, and I will see you in the next segment. This is our short-term view of the coming week. This is when we take a look at five different markets. We look at the daily charts, take uh, in, into consideration what's going on in the longer charts, the intermediate uh, phases. Uh, but basically the focus that we're going to have right now is on the shorter charts. The uh, charts we're going to look at are light crude gold, the euro currency uh, as our proxy for the dollar, the um, treasury market, we look at the 10-year note, and we'll look at the stock market and the VIX. So uh, in the light crude market, um, we had that one uh, come down to the area we were looking at, uh, but then got a little more strength that we expected. Uh, we can't get much credit for that because it was a stronger market than we expected. Gold market, we thought we were going to get a small dip and then uh, another small rally. We did get that. The euro, um, that market went absolutely nowhere, just sideways. I'll show you that chart. So not much in there. Uh, the As far as the bond market goes, we were looking for a small down week. It was an up week. I mean, there was hardly any down movement at all. As uh, we, when the yen fell apart, it seems like buyers started to come in uh, into the bond market as a flight to safety. And the stock market, we expected a small choppy week getting ready for another upturn. We did actually get that. We only get a 50% this week uh, based on our accountability on those sh uh, short-term uh, looks at the charts. Uh, the previous week we were at 60 and the week before that we were at 90 percent. So we have a little bit of an erosion going on and we're going to be better at it in the coming week. So let's take a look now as we look at the light crude market. Here's that light crude chart, the daily chart. Now what we look at in here is two different um, uh, periods of cycle uh, patterns and you can see this nice rally and sell off in here that's really the um, uh, the bigger pattern and this one this rally in here and this sell off <coughs> which we didn't believe was over I still don't believe it's over we have these smaller patterns going on that have settled in around seven days so you can see the rally and the sell off for seven days this seven day pattern in here and now it's rallied up here uh, about three or four days that really calls for a decline in here we're going to look for the next four to six days on the downside as uh, maybe some discussion about this um, uh, pot potential freeze uh, they start to talk about that's really not going to happen and uh, if it does it's going to happen just at such high levels with Iran not um, following it anyway it's it's just really a weak possibility so we don't think that oil's got much more on the upside in here at all we're going to look for this uh, corrective period in here to continue potentially getting back under the 36 level uh, sometime in the next four to six days take a look now here at the gold market forward slash gc um, we were looking for kind of a down up week last week and it's pretty much what we got take a look here there's a lot of cycles overlapping each other because we have silver and GDX and gold here all on the same page uh, so that we can see how those different patterns are acting together. Here's where the two gold markets uh, uh, were coming down. We thought we were going to get this decline in this rally. That is what we got. It moves up to the minor resistance zone here. Actually, we actually don't think we because we think there's going to be a pullback in the in the miners, which are due for a pullback. And I think this min this minor resistance is going to be really tough. We're going to call a narrow range in here this week. Uh, 20, uh, 1250 is the top of this minor resistance. And we're going to look for it to you know, maybe play around in here a little more and have a tough time uh, holding up through that 1250 number. But then this area is where it got support during the week around 
1220 is also going to be pretty tough right now when we have this advancing cycle going on uh, to break the market. So we're kind of looking for a tight range in here between this 1250 number here and this 1220 number right around here. So we're going to call that tight range, small change on the week in the gold market. Euro currency, well, we were looking for the dollar to strengthen it kind of didn't and it was really hurt by the yen but the dollar kind of just held even and so did the euro currency so we'll put the euro up here and you're going to see you know one of the uh, biggest uh, longest little sideways movement here you've seen in a while as it's really gone absolutely nowhere getting a little bit of an uptick in here today but <clears throat> it looks to me like it's going to pull down we're still looking for dollar to get a rally and yen to get a pullback in here uh, so this period in here coincides with what we're looking for uh, in we'll call it uh, you know this next whole week four or five days of correction in here and we're looking for it to get down now to about 112.40 uh, where that support is so we're going to look for a weaker uh, yen uh, this week and, uh, and that uh, coincides with uh, the dollar getting a bounce against the yen I think it's all going to work together this week take a look here at the um, forward slash zn uh, as I said we were looking for that to have a little bit of a downtick in here uh, during this week and then uh, we said a few more weeks on the upside we're actually still looking for that downtick I actually need to uh, switch this over to a two-year to get those cycles to line up properly there we go and here it is now you see that proper cycle alignment uh, as uh, you see this bigger three cycles nesting in here brought that decline three cycles on the upside in here brought that advance this is right here where we thought we were going to get a pullback right in here, but it, you know, we're still looking for it, but it really should not be much. So we'll call this a very, very minor correction, narrow range this week, and uh, that might coincide with the stock market trying to get some upside rally, but uh, then we think this has got another few weeks in here on the upside there. So we're just going to look for minor correction, uh, sell off that doesn't really hold uh, in the treasury market. So the stock market last week, we were looking for a downside chop. We looked for that last week also. Uh, in fact, the bigger uh, potential correction the previous week, and uh, that didn't happen. Uh, and that just told us how strong the market was at that time. There are things going on now in the market that are a warning to me that this big advance that we've had over the seven weeks or so is done. Now, uh, I had last week said I thought there was one more rally, but the characteristic of the market that we have right now is telling me that, yeah, it's possible we do get that one more rally, but that the rallies are likely to fail a little faster than I thought last week. And I'm going to show you what I'm looking at in here as I put up the SPX. And that when we look at the VIX, uh, you're going to see a change in there also, both of those uh, suggesting that this stock market is running out of gas and we're into uh, getting ready to move into this corrective period. So I'm going to go through some uh, little um, uh, some cycle analysis in here. So you get a sense as I think out loud as to what happened, why I'm believing that the stock market is running into some trouble here. So uh, I want you to note the repeating patterns in here that have been coming up. You can see the 16 here on this cycle low. You can see this 17-day low right over here. That's the distance right here. And we were uh, looking for a low here on day 16. You can see that, that, that uh, 17 right there. Now, you got a rally right over here, but then you pulled back and you made... Uh, actually a 19th day low and rallies are beginning to fail you can see here on Friday as you cannot hold the rally so I'm going to take a closer look in here for you to see what's going on so here's a key level and that's that high made on the update that we had on Wednesday and that is 2066 <clears throat> here is another key level and that's the low that was made here of 2034 on Thursday those are very important levels based on this analysis. So the first of all, what I'm looking at is the fact that it got down through 19 days into this period over here is, is a negative. When cycles lengthen out, it means that there are more sellers around. 
and that is your first tip off that there are problems. Then when rallies like this fail and you get another low like we did and then rallies like on Friday fail like you see right now, that is a problem. There is a potential that this is the whole rally period and we're in for a major correction right over here as the weekly pressures take over the longer terms. So this is a very, very significant period. It was last week that I said we're going to learn a lot from the coming rally. Well, I'm learning a lot from the rally right now. It can't hold, and it actually is trying to come from a, a later period. All of that is negative on cycle theory, and uh, that has me worried that this low is going to be taken out. If this low is taken out at 2034, it will confirm this pattern that you see in here. If that low is not taken out and you get a rally and it takes out 2066, then it will simply say that we are into this advance, which is likely not to last long, and then roll over again. So I'm telling you they're negative or they're negative. It's just how far can they get up before they roll over into a correction. Right now, based on what we're seeing here, the odds favor the downside, and I'm going to call this as a negative scenario and that this big rally that we had in here uh, right over here from uh, the roughly 1800 number all the way down up to about 2075 uh, that that's a long way and it needs a correction and that these patterns that you can see in here this is the rut pattern right there this is the S&P patterns in here that those are taking over and starting to push on the downside. So that says to me that uh, based on the, the way we're seeing things in here, that this is uh, a negative scenario that is shaping up. We'll learn a lot in the next couple days. Now, this is the VIX. Now, what I had said about the VIX last week, and I left this other pattern in here, that's this one right in here, that I thought it was going to kind of, after this rally, you know, meander its way down for another week or so as the stock market had a little more rally, and then after that get a big rally, which I'll show you on the weekly. This pattern has changed, and you can see this dotted line in here as it's extended out. The fact that it got up to over 16, uh, that uh, VIX got up over 16 in the last week, says a bottom is in the making, and that says that the stock market has a top in the making. When I look here at this, uh, you can see the new uh, projection right in here, which says that you know, you're likely to keep churning on the upside in here in implied volatilities. When I look here at the weekly pattern, we were looking for a bottom to form in the next week coming up in here, that decline and then beginning into this rally in implied volatility. We have very likely entered that period of rising implied volatilities, and that says that the stock market is in some trouble here. So the implied volatility going up tells us that it's the very beginning of that process of people wanting to pay more money for protection in the market. We're only in the very, very beginning phase of that. And you can see, as I described in the stock market, that it's uh, telling us that this stronger period we had is now weakening all of this bottoming and implied volatility and weakening in the pattern in the stock market says to me that th th there's a top forming in there. We could get one more try on the upside uh, under 2034 on the S&P 500. I think that completely uh, changes the pattern to negative, so we're going to be looking at that very, very carefully. That is it for Market Week this week. I hope you have had an opportunity to look at uh, the um, special that we had. Uh, and uh, if you're an active trader, I think there's a lot of things in there that um, you're going to feel uh, because uh, we talk about 16 um, uh, signs that fear is contaminating your trading. And that we can work on that. That can be uh, uh, fixed uh, as uh, we all evolve and get better as traders, hopefully. That's it for the week. I hope you have a great week and a great weekend. And I'm always wishing you great trading. Well, I'm going to the center and I'm going to